and good morning again. Uh, today we are continuing our journey through Mark's Gospel. We are still in chapter 1, and we are going to pick up right where we left off last Sunday uh, with Jesus having healed the demoniac in the synagogue, if you recall, and uh, then he leaves there and he is going to go to Simon Peter's home. Um, and if you remember, I mentioned that, uh, that when Gail and I were in Israel last year, we were at Simon Peter's home. Um, we, we, he, when we were there, he wasn't there. We missed him by just that much. So maybe a couple thousand years or so, Terry. But, but in God's time, that's just a blink of an eye, isn't it? So um, we, we practically rub shoulders with, with Peter. But anyway, um, when you're there, um, the, the, you, you can see, and it's literally, as I said before, it's just a stone's throw away. It's like a block from, from where Peter's house is to the synagogue. Now the synagogue, again, is not there. There is the, the, the old synagogue that would have been there at Jesus' time. They built a new one on top of it. It's about the third century, the synagogue, the ruins of the synagogue that are still there. But their ruins are beautiful, and it's a beautiful place. Um, and you can see it from the Catholic church that's built over the top of Peter's home. That church actually looks kind of for all the world like a UFO on landing here, perched over the top of it. And you can look right down into that, into the, what they believe is the home of Peter. It is one of the more moving and, 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 and emotional places that we were in the Holy Land. I do want to reiterate that uh, so that you understand. It is a very moving and touching place. When you look down and you see that, that house where Jesus very well may have stayed uh, because Capernaum was his, you know, where they were operating out of. And for certain, even if that's not the house, that street that goes right by that house that you're looking down on goes right to the synagogue. And so it's a town of about 1,500 people at the time of Jesus. So most likely Jesus is sometimes walked on those stones that you're looking at down there. And that's very, very touching and, and moving. So with that, we are going to leave the synagogue and go that hop, skip, and a jump, literally almost, to Peter's home. And that's where we pick up today with uh, verses 29 to 39 in Mark's Gospel, the very first chapter. So, Mark 1, 29, 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew, with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons who would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also. For this is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, for, for Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogue and casting out demons. Now this morning I'm going to do this in the fashion, even though Scotty is not with us, I'm going to do it, the, go through this in the fashion that Scotty likes, where I go by, through it verse by verse, and as we call it, Scottify, um, this, the, the scripture here. But I'm going to, before I do that, I'm going to read this one to you from the Young's Literal Translation. Um, and as I mentioned before, oftentimes when you go to a literal translation, it becomes what they typically call wooden. It becomes a bit clumsy and oftentimes a little hard to understand. But for some reason, when I read this passage, these 11 verses in Young's Literal Translation, it catches the energy of this much better, I think, than the NRSV did. I find this, to me, there's something really beautiful about reading this in Young's Little Translation. That's not normally the case, um, but maybe I'm starting to change. Maybe at least in Mark's Gospel, Young's Little Translation works better. I don't know, it's interesting. Uh, for one thing, you notice that there was no mention of the word immediately in the NRSV. We talked about that last week. I think we had three or four occurrences of immediately last week in the scripture we looked at. Today, he didn't say it once. And, and then, of course, he didn't see then either in the NRSV. But it's there, that yothios, that 
Greek word that means immediately. They've translated it as soon as in one place and uh, about her and at once in another. And the other one, let's see, verse 31. Um, and they don't even have it there in 31. They don't even use it there. They, they don't even use anything. They won't really like it. They, they say then instead of immediately. Then and immediately are quite different in this one. They, there's a message and emotion that it conveys. Liter you know, literature has a, you know, there's a reason for literature. And oftentimes when you're writing, you, you know, I've taken a lot of creative writing classes in my life. Uh, I, you know, at one time I wanted to be an author, believe it or not, that's one of the other things I wanted to do. But, but when you're writing, you're oftentimes told to use different words, mix it up so you don't sound redundant. But then the other thing is, when you're writing prose and you're writing things, if you repeat words, sometimes there's great power in that. And that's what happens with Euphilos. It's used over and over, 42 times in Mark's Gospel. And when you get rid of it and you change it, you lose something. You lose a lot. So let's, let's look at this before we go through it verse by verse. And I think I'm going to go through it verse by verse in Young's Literal Translation. But let me read it in its entirety to you from Young's Literal Translation. And see if you get if you catch a different sense about what's going on here. And, and the emotion feels different. And immediately... Having come forth out of the synagogue, they went to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And the mother-in-law of Simon was lying fevered, and immediately they tell him about her. And having come near, he raised her up. Having laid hold of her hand, and the fever left her immediately, and she was ministering to them. And evening having come, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all who were ill and who were demoniacs. And the whole city was gathered together near the door. And he healed many who were ill of manifold diseases, and many demons he cast forth, and was not suffering the demons to speak, because they knew him. And very early it began yet night. It being yet night, having risen, he went forth, and went away to a desert place, and was there praying. And Simon and those with him went in quest of him. And having found him, they say to him, all do seek thee. And he saith to them, We may go to the next towns, and there also I may preach, for for this I came forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues in all Galilee, and is casting out the demons. Is there a different emotion to that? Yeah. Jared's saying yes. I agree with Jared. Come on. Uh, it definitely has a different feeling to it. And some of that's the old English of it, but some of that's just the cadence and the, 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 the way he's worded it. And immediately from the synagogue, it, we're rushing, we're moving fast. We've gone through, we talked about it last week, all the things we've gone through in the first chapter of John, or Mark, rather, we're moving quickly. And we're not done with the first chapter yet. They come to the house of Simon and Andrew. And John and James, at least, are with them. Uh, the mother-in-law is there laying fever down. Having a fever in the ancient world was not a good thing. Uh, that meant you were probably uh, probably back, an infection or you had uh, with a bacteria or you might have had a viral thing. That's not good. And many times those things could be fatal. Well, fever is something to be very concerned about. And immediately, as soon as they get to the house, they tell Jesus about Peter's mother-in-law that she is ill now something happens here there's a lot that happens in verse 31 there's a lot there that we have to unpack and having come near he raised her up having laid hold of her hand and the fever left her immediately and she was ministering to them well what day is this yet and I don't think I mentioned it last week but it was the Sabbath right he healed the demoniac in the temple, or in the synagogue, rather. He healed the demoniac in the synagogue on the Sabbath. That was frowned upon. We went there from there immediately to Peter's house, so it's still the Sabbath. It's Shabbat. So he's gone to, to Peter's house, and now he's healed his mother-in-law, and that's also forbidden on the Sabbath. He's worked, he's done two works. 
on the Sabbath. Jesus just doesn't, is not paying any attention to the Sabbath laws. But he's done more than that. I've often heard pastors mention and, and commentators mention kind of jokingly and flippantly that he just went there to heal her so she would make them suffer. A meal. A meal. And uh, there's more to it than that. In the Greek, when it says he raised her up, that literally would mean he scooped her up. He picked her up, like putting his arm around her back and under her legs and picked her out of bed. It's not like he grabbed her hand and pulled her up. He picked her up in his arms. That's work too. He lifted someone. You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. You can't only walk a certain distance to, to, to the synagogue or to the temple on the Sabbath. He's done three, three works now on the temple, He's or on the Sabbath. And he's also just done what? He's just touched a woman that is not a relative of his. Now, whether that was the Sabbath or not, that was forbidden. You don't touch a woman that's not a relative. You just don't do that. But Jesus just did. So, Terry, are you keeping score? Where are we at now? Four. Yeah, okay. Terry's going to keep track for me here. Um, so we're four things. Guess what? She's laying in bed with a fever, right? She's sick. So he's also done what? He's just touched someone that's sick. And if you touch someone that's sick, what do you become? Unclean. Because she's not clean. She's got a fever. She would have to go through a process of becoming clean again. Um, but Jesus has now touched her, which is what not supposed to do. Even if she were well, that would be forbidden. But he's now touched her when she's ill, and so now he's unclean. So I think that gets us to five now. So Jesus is at five now. But he and immediately the fever is gone. He touched her, he picked her up, and she's well. She then begins to minister to them. There's a problem with that, too. At least, it's the Sabbath. <laughs> when we were in Israel, one of the things you found out when you went to eat, the Sabbath goes from sundown to sundown. Sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Well, we're going to come up pretty soon when it, the, 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 city, the sun is going to go down. The sun did set in the next verse. But the sun hasn't set yet, because we don't, we don't find that out until the verse 32. So when he healed her, the sun was up, and she got up and started taking care of everyone. Now, most likely, she was sick for a day or so, and so most likely, she didn't have the meal prepared. Because like I was going to say, when you're there for, for Sabbath, first of all, the people that are working in the motels and whatnot are not Jewish. They're either Christian or Muslim. All right? And they have that there. But the food that you're eating is not hot food either. It's pre-prepared food. They might warm it up, but it's not food that's been freshly cooked. It's more like having finger food. So it'd be more like they're having cold cuts and cheese and crackers or that kind of a thing is what they would have served. But since she was sick, she probably didn't prepare any of that. So there's nothing to serve to these, these, this rabbi who's at five violations right here. Five violations already, this rabbi. There's nothing to give to this honored guest that's come to your home. So she gets up and she starts ministering to them. Ministering is a great word. It's not just like, you know, to serve them. Ministering means to serve them, but there's, a, there's an extension to that beyond just serving when you say the word ministering. I like that word much better. Maybe because I'm a minister. I don't know. Uh, but she's ignored Sabbath law. She got up and took care of them. She's worked. That gets us to six, I think, doesn't it? Uh, it's not all on Jesus. One of, some of it's on Mother in law. But we missed that. And I honestly don't think I've seen a single sermon or a single commentary mention the fact that she gets up on the Sabbath and starts working. And I don't know why that is. They missed that point. They're so wrapped up and she's gonna get up and he just wants her to cook for them or to get, you know, to take care of them. They missed the part about she's doing this. She's ignoring it. And why is she doing that? 
Because one of the things that if you look at Mark's gospel overarching, there's one group that always seems to miss the mark. No pun intended. And that's the disciples. The men, specifically. The men never seem to know what's going on. They're, that's kind of normal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We never know what's going on. But who does know what's going on? Who is at the foot of the cross? The women. This is the first woman healed in Mark's gospel. It's also the first person probably to really understand who Jesus is and that he, she needs to serve him. All this law is Shabbat. Forget about it. This is important. My Savior is here. I'm going to serve him. It's a life of service. And we talked about that before. And remember in John's Gospel, when they have the Last Supper, the Last Supper is long, it goes from, from chapter 13 to the end of 17 in John's Gospel, but there's no Last Supper. There's no breaking the body and the bread and the, the blood and all of that. It's about washing feet and about serving each other. And so this is what's happening here. She's ministering to them. She is the first to recognize who Jesus is, I believe. And evening having come, when the sun did set, now Sabbath is over. Guess what? Now all those people that weren't about to come to Jesus because it's the Sabbath, and you, first of all, you can't walk far enough to get to him, but they're coming in the dark now because the, the sun has to set, so it's in the dark. They're coming to him. And so you've got a lot of what going on, a lot of activity, because it says the whole city was gathered together near the door. Everybody's crowded in to the area of the synagogue around Peter's house. And in some ways, the synagogue means gathering place. Guess what's become the gathering place now? Where Jesus is. The synagogue is now where Jesus is. And he healed many who were ill of manifold diseases. I love that word, manifold. That's a word we need to start using again. Uh, you know, it is a myriad of things, a multitude of things. A lot of diseases. It's, a, it's just a whole bunch to use something that's more colloquial. But manifold diseases, that's a great word. And many demons he cast forth. And he was not suffering the demons to speak because they knew him. Just like what he did in the synagogue. He didn't allow that demon. Remember that when he told that demon to be quiet, remember that the, the language he used, and I was talking to Clyde about this morning and reminding him, that was rough language. Basically he said, shut up, and then a little more. It's a little stronger than just that. But in the Greek, it's not being nice. He's being very curt to use a nice word. And very early, it being yet night, people have started to leave because it's just they're, they have, they're estimating, and I don't know how they begin to guess that, but they're saying it's like three to five in the morning is what commentators say. Don't know how they, if they're coming up with that. All it tells us is it's very early and it's not yet light. The sun has not risen. But Jesus gets up and he leaves the house where everybody else, is, we'll assume, has gone to sleep. Because it's been a very active day, wasn't it? With all of that energy going on, rushing to the synagogue, rushing home, this crush of people coming in, getting the healing of, of Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus did a lot. And it was a so I can believe that everybody has crashed, as you say, but not Jesus. He gets up and he goes out and he prays. And the message there is that in life, we have so much chaos, don't we? So much going on. It's just immediately, immediately, immediately. Everything's now, now, now. Rush, rush, rush. And in the middle of all this, and this crush of people coming, everyone gathered to the door, the whole city. And amongst this crush of people and all of this chaos, Jesus gets up early and he goes out to a quiet place. And what's he do? He prays. He spends time alone with the Father in prayer. That's a message to all of us. Because all of us deal with chaos in our lives looking at day-to-day -day activities, the chaos of having children and grandchildren. Jody's back there. Are you tired yet, Jody? No. <laughs> Noah's birthday is yesterday. Are you tired yet? No. The chaos of that, 
and illness and aging and all of those other things that come along in life, they wear us down and we feel like we're sometimes just crushed. We need to remember this book. Do what Jesus did. And go find a quiet place. Go into your closet, as they say. And that closet, that actually means to, it's a prayer shawl, and you hold the shawl over your head, and Gail and I, Gail bought a prayer shawl over Israel. It's really an interesting thing, the whole process of that. But that literally is what the closet means. You go under your prayer shawl. You find that place, and it's a place of solace. It's a place of sanctuary where you commune with the Father one-on-one. And we all need to do that. We all need to do more of that. I need to do more of that. Each and every one of us needs to do more. Verse 36. And Simon and those with him went in quest of him. That's a little different than what it says that they hunted for him, doesn't it? Quest, that's another great word. It literally means to go hunting for something to take a captive, is what it means in Greek. So quest. The quest has a much grand, more grandiose. They're looking. It's, there's, there is much import to that. It's an important thing. Jesus is not here. We've got to go and find him. Again, we could take that very close to heart. That's life application, isn't it? Yeah. We need to go and find him. If we've misplaced him, we need to go looking for him. And when it says in the next verse, and having found him, they say to him, all do seek thee. That word in Greek means literally that they've misplaced something. It's all they're looking for. Everyone's looking for that thing they've misplaced. And that very much applies to our relationship with Jesus. We need to have that quiet time with God, with Christ. We need to seek Him. We need to go and find Him. I think we lost. And then Jesus, of course, says, And He saith to them, for some reason I just love this, and you know, little. And He saith to them, We may go to the next towns, and there also I may preach. Before this I came forth. The healing is great, is what He's saying. The healing is important. People need to be healed. But what's the important part? It's the message. It's to share with people that God loves them, that God is here for them, that no matter what you are going through, all of this chaos that we've talked about, God is there, and he loves you. That's what he came for. Because guess what? All those people that he healed that were dying, now the demoniac says a different thing, and that, 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 uh, that's a little different. But the people that are suffering from illness, and many of the people who are suffering from illness, they would have thought were demon-possessed, but that's neither here nor there. Those people that he healed, guess what they all ultimately did? He brought Lazarus back from the dead, and what did Lazarus ultimately did? He ultimately died. None of us is here forever. That's not what was meant for us. What's meant for us is that message that he's come to us, that preaching that he's going to do, that teaching sharing the love of God, the message of Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven. And he was preaching in their synagogues in all Galilee and casting out the demons. He didn't forget about the earthly cares of the people. He was still dealing with the illness and the, and the, 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 the problems. Much of that would have been psychological issues that, were, that they would have called demons. We would have called some kind of a psychological issue. But he didn't forget about caring for those people. We don't want to do that either. We want to preach the word, but we also need to remember that we need to care for people too. We need to heal people here as well. So it's a dual process, but you never ever forget that your first and foremost thing is just like Jesus is that we share the word. That's the first thing to do. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the message that Mark has given us here, this message of, of hope, this message of of, of grace, of this message that the, the most important thing in the story is Jesus himself. Let it be the most important thing in each and every one of our lives as well. We pray this in your name. Amen.